Hi, everyone, and welcome once again to uh, one of our environmental science partnership event series. This is Hobby Memorial Library, and we have it with us some representatives today. We have Virginia Sanders. She is the prescribed fire program manager for Fort Hood. So, hi, Virginia. Hi. And we also have Mr. Carl Swope, fire management officer at Balconies Canyonlands National Wildlife Refuge. So, he's pretty far away and he's going to be talking to us today. Hey, Carl. Hi. Well, um, Virginia, I have been waiting for this event because I moved here a little about a few years ago and I saw massive fires and I just thought we were all on fire around here. So um, I'm anxious to hear what you have to say about prescribed burns. So go ahead and take it away. Okay, good. I'm glad to hear that you're interested. Okay, so I'm sharing my screen with you here in a minute. Go. So, as Cindy said, I'm Virginia Sanders from the DPW Natural Resources Office. I'm going to talk about prescribed burning at Fort Hood. On this slide in the background is a picture of a prescribed burn that we did at the installation. Just as a basic explanation of what prescribed burning is, it's the intentional application of fire to achieve a desired objective. So this presentation today is going to be in two parts. Um, after I complete my part, I have invited Carl Schwab from the Balcones Canyonlands National Wildlife Refuge to talk about fire as well. And I, I invited him to do that because we have developed a partnership with his organization to help us jointly execute the prescribed burning program at Fort Hood. And that photo shows a team, a joint team that we've used this last year. And part of the, and this partnership has been very successful. And part of the reason that, that um, this is so important to the DOD is that we are looking at ways to improve the way that we operate prescribed fire across the DOD and within the Department of the Army. So part of that is the National Wildfire Coordinating Group, which is an organization that has very specific training and qualification standards and operational guidance. So the DOD hopes that that can help us to make our operations more effective, more efficient and safer. So how does prescribed burning fit into the mission of the military? There's for the land management and the areas that I'm talking about are the training areas and the live fire areas. And those are outside of the installation atonement area that you would think of as a municipality. So for example, on Fort Hood, we have about 197,000 acres of lands that are managed and we have two complementary objectives. The range control branch has the mission to sustain those training lands for military forces into perpetuity. And then the environmental division manages those lands for the plants, the animals, the cultural resources, the air, the water. And to make sure that we are responsible environmental stewards because Though that is a value of our American public that we that we sustain that. So to give you an example of the. The diversity that we want to maintain across the landscape for the military training. For example, when the military is doing maneuver training with tracked vehicles or wheeled vehicles. The grasslands are a great place for them to do that training exercise. But the military also needs the shrublands and the tree land, the, the forested areas, so that they can have cover and concealment, as well as soldiers that are doing dismounted training if they're maneuvering on foot. And so those that same diversity of landscape is important for the environment mental side of the, the management. And 
part of the reason that the, the DOD has been able to do this management of those lands and, and maintain that diversity is because even though military training does cause disturbance on the landscape, it's nowhere near as, doesn't have near the impact that it would if these lands were being developed into housing areas or business parks. One of the things that, because we have these lands, when there are endangered species found on them, we have a responsibility to help try to recover those species. And among the DOD, we have over 500 threatened and endangered species that we manage and many more that are species at risk. So um, it's not that we are causing those species to come extinct. A more accurate statement would be that because we have these lands that aren't being developed, these are opportunities for refugia for those species. So just to give you a, a basic overview of some of the categorizations of how we categorize ecosystems as grasslands, shrublands, and woodlands. And there's lots of subtypes when you get into the science behind it. But there's a succession that happens among those ecosystem types. So grasslands left undisturbed can eventually grow into shrublands and then those can develop into woodlands. So when you apply fire to the, the landscape, that's a tool you can use to set back that successional stage to an, to an earlier stage of development. And that helps to maintain a diversity on the installation. So we want that balance to be there both for so that there's diversity of training landscape for the soldiers, but also for the ecosystem. So you can see that there's really distinct plant communities in each of these different ecosystem types. But there's also distinct, a distinct set of species that each require their own niche and their own characteristics in order to survive and then to thrive. And I just chose a few examples of species, but there's thousands of different species of plants and animals on our installation just at Fort Hood. And then if you look across the Army, this, there are so many more. And several of my coworkers have done presentations through the CTC Library Facebook page. So if you want to learn more about the monarch butterfly, the black cat barrier or the golden cheek warbler, those presentations are available for you to look at. So prescribed burning is a tool that can be beneficial for us. And these are just some really basic benefits that we rely upon. So if we apply fire to a grassland area adjacent to the endangered species habitat for the golden cheek warbler, which is a forested area, we can reduce the risk of that habitat to wildfires. And using that same principle on the live fire training areas, when the soldiers are conducting training, it reduces their risk of wildfire. And one of the benefits to them, if we can reduce the, the wildfire, is that they don't have to spend as much time stopping their training and trying to put out the fire or waiting for assistance to help put that out. The other thing that wildfire reduces is the ash juniper that starts to grow into the grassland areas. And in this photo, you can see it's a, a fire that we had on a range. And if you can see my cursor, these um, small shrubs are small juniper trees in the background. They are vulnerable to fire. So when we apply it in a landscape like this, it can help reduce that successional stage of juniper coming into a grassland. So there's benefits both to the ecosystem and to the soldier training when we do that. So for the there's many grassland species, such as the monarch that I mentioned earlier, that benefit from that. And then for the shrublands, we also manage those. If, for example, for the black cat vireo, so if we're applying fire to a shrubland area, we can keep that from becoming too mature and growing out of the appropriate habitat for the vireo. And then 
the benefit to the soldier for maintaining some of those grassland areas is having that open maneuver space for them to uh, work on. So right now I work as a wildlife biologist, but I'm also a former commissioned officer in the US Army Aviation Branch. So I know that soldiers must have a lot of practice on their weapon systems to become proficient in operating those systems to fight and win our nation's wars because that's what they're tasked to do. And you can see from these photos that there is a certain pyrotechnic or flammable nature to these training rounds. So the Department of the Defense understands that military training has a component, it's just inherent that there's going to be training related wildfires on the installation. So for decades, we have been using prescribed fire on installations to reduce the fuel load. And so when we talk about fuel load, we're referring to vegetation that is, would be, have the potential to become flammable. And Lastly, I wanted to talk about smoke as a result of these fires. And we acknowledge that smoke can be bothersome. And we are really fortunate that around the military community, we have a lot of support. And that is necessary for Fort Hood's success. So we take that seriously and we are mindful to do our best to minimize smoke dissipation. But there's also things for the public to keep in mind where they can continue to help support these operations. And one is smoke and fire are very exciting to observe. But we encourage you to observe those from afar wherever you might be. If you try to travel to the location to observe those, oftentimes you can hinder emergency response or the operations we're trying to conduct or potentially put yourself at, at greater risk. And then if you're on a roadway and there is smoke, make sure that you follow whatever personnel or signs that might be there. So in this photo, you can see that we put up an orange sign on the road, notifying people driving by of the prescribed fire. So in this case, when you see the sign, you know that we're doing official operations and there's no need to call in the fire. And then if there is smoke, uh, turn on your headlights, it makes you more visible. Roll up your windows, recirculate the air. And then one of the things we do when we, prior to doing prescribed burn operations is we will send out notifications on social media. So if you, many times you can see on Facebook, the location of where the burn is and what roads are adjacent to that. And that way, if you, if you prefer, you can choose an alternate route during the time that we're doing the, conducting those operations. And that concludes everything that I have to present, unless there's questions before we move on to Carl's presentation. Alyssa, any questions at the moment? Not right now. So, all right. Well, thank That's you, good. Virginia. Carl, yes, you're up. <laughs> all right. Let me. I think I have to stop sharing. Oh, it worked. All right. Well, I will then share something. I guess let me know. We see it. You're good. All right. All right. Well, good afternoon. What I'll do is um, I'll talk a little bit about why um, why we use prescribed fire. Uh, what are some of the ecological benefits of that? And one of the things that Virginia mentioned uh, the cooperation between uh, Fort Hood and then the Balcones Refuge uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And that's a partnership that works for, for a number of reasons, but one of the reasons uh, we have very identical habitat types. So what we've done historically with prescribed fire down at the Balcones Refuge uh, is the exact same thing that needs to be done from an ecological standpoint at Fort Hood. So very similar habitat types. So it was easy to, to crosswalk both fire programs. 
but why prescribe fire? Um, and, and, and I'll get into some, some specific reasons um, that Virginia alluded to. But really, just fire as a natural ecological process is important in most uh, vegetation types, uh, not just in this, this local area, the, the Edwards Plateau Hill Country region of Texas, but just across most vegetation types. Fire has some sort of a role in that. Uh, and some dendrochronology work that was done out at the refuge um, back in 2010, now, pretty interesting. Um, you don't, don't often think of, um, you know, maybe this area is having woodland or forest types, but what we do, they're, they're not, not as old or, or as big as, as some of the forests and pine type forests that we think about, but we do have a lot of uh, wooded trees that uh, have age to them and, and dendrochronology work can be there. And, and within that dendrochronology, you can uh, determine um, historical fire events. Um, and what the study showed is that across the the refuge uh, had a return interval of about five and a half years of, of fire historically. This map here uh, always find interesting because this, this tells you if a fire were to burn today, given climate uh, and the chemistry soil types, basically how long before the vegetation grew back to a point that fire could burn again. And even though, um, you know, the part of Texas we're in uh, may seem arid, may seem dry, it's a, it's a humid type. And so we do get a lot of precipitation and vegetation grows, by, grows back pretty fast. And according to this map, you can see that we could have a fire return interval of somewhere less than two years, uh, two to four years for most of the state. But uh, the part that, that we're in, uh, the vegetation could grow back to a point that would support fire uh, every two years. So what this is saying is that this part of this part of Texas um, does have uh, does need fire as part of an ecological process and the fire return interval is pretty frequent. Uh, so what so some specific reasons why we burn uh, one of the probably the most obvious reasons is maintain grasslands uh, grasslands and savanna types. Virginia talked about earlier, without some sort of fire, without some sort of disturbance in a grassland, eventually it will be colonized by woody vegetation, move into a shrubland, then into a woodland. So periodic fire helps maintain that grassland, uh, maintains, uh, and not just grasses, but all sorts of species that, that thrive in a, in a prairie or, or savanna type ecosystem. So there's forb species and, and grassland species. So it's not just that you uh, just burn it, um, when you burn it, makes a big difference. If you burn during the winter time, which is what we consider a dormant season for the grasses they've cured out, uh, what returns after that fire uh, is one type of vegetation. Then if you were to say burn during the summertime, which is a growing season of the grasses, then that would produce a different type of vegetation response. And typically winter burns, those dormant season burns favor uh, native grasses and native grasses green up right away in the springtime uh, when they germinate and then uh, and it really uh, favors native grasses. If you burn more in the summertime, uh, even up until now, uh, early fall, uh, what typically responds then is the forbs. Uh, most of the, the wildflower species, if you think of those forb type species, they all germinate in the fall uh, and then they'll have their rosette or, or that, that early stage of growing and it kind of sits Look, it looks dormant, but just a little green on, on the ground. And then in the spring, then the, the top portion grows up. And typically we see that as wildflowers and things. So when you burn, it's important to maintaining different types of species uh, within a, a grassland and savanna ecosystem. Uh, this picture here shows something that happens a lot without fire and more of the savanna types uh, is you get a lot of juniper encroachment. Uh, different species eat juniper berries. Uh, birds, for example, will then land in the trees, drop those berries. And so you take a, typically get colonization of these types of woody plants. Uh, usually starts in, in the trees that are within a grassland and within the savanna and then move outward. So we do need fire. If we didn't have periodic fire throughout the savanna, this would then turn into a woodland instead of a savanna. We also get other types of invader species here. 
uh, one of the things you see is juniper coming in. You see some mesquite coming in, uh, backers coming in. Uh, periodic fire helps uh, remove these woody plants, maintain that as an open grassland. This is the same area, just looking at it from a different point of view. Prickly pear is another one uh, that can be maintained with fire. And all of these species that we're talking about, whether it's juniper or, or mesquite or bacris or prickly pear, they all have a place in ecosystems. Uh, so it's not trying to eliminate them. It's just trying to manage them into what would be a maybe a, what we consider a, a more historical state. Here you just see juniper filling in an open space between woodlands. You know, periodic fire, we can maintain that open space as a grassland. Next thing we'll talk about is um, using prescribed fire to help manage for the black cat vireo. As we know, the black cat vireo, uh, the type of vegetation uh, characteristics they like is a shrub type vegetation. Uh, but low shrub, uh, usually two meters, six feet or less. Uh, so short shrubs and then in, in a mosaic pattern to where the shrubs only cover, say, 30 to 60 percent of the total given area. So with periodic fire, uh, without fire, these shrublands then move into a woodland, uh, part of that transition stage. So if this is an area that we want to maintain as a shrubland, we would need periodic fire. This is a basically a Chinook shrubland in this photo uh, that has gone probably decades, you know, 30 plus years without any type of disturbance and has moved into a, a woodland. So if we want to manage that for as a shrubland, um, then fire would be a, a way we can do that. Uh, typically things that we look at that would uh, show that a shrubland is degrading uh, as a as habitat for black cat vireo um, anytime uh, juniper starts to dominate that shrubland, uh, if it has 25% uh, junipers, more than 25% of the canopy cover, and anytime uh, that vegetation starts to get over three meters tall, uh, that those are all decreased habitat suitability factors. Or if it just becomes too dense. Earlier I said that it needs to be a mosaic, something 30 to 60 percent, say half of the ground is shrub and half would be grass. If it starts getting over 70 percent, then we see vireos uh, starting to, to not use that area as much. So we can come back in, burn that, keep all that shrub in a in a low state, in a mosaic state you know, with periodic fire. One of the things that we can do really well with fires manage height. It's a little bit harder to manage uh, density, because most woody plants uh, in, in our part respond uh, favorably to fire uh, in that they'll just sprout back out from the roots um, or sprout back out from the base. Uh, pretty much all woody plants will do that, including prickly pear. The only woody plant that we have that isn't uh, fire tolerant would be the ash juniper. It, it is not a sprouter. So once it is burned or scorched, then it, then it will stay uh, burned or scorched. It, it won't re-sprout back out. So with shin oak, we can burn it, uh, set it back, and, and it'll it'll re-sprout back out. Um, so with periodic uh, uh, prescribed fire on a periodic cycle, uh, typically in, in say the um, the shrublands, we would look at somewhere. Um, three to seven, five to seven, somewhere uh, years rotation, uh, you know, just depends on, on where it was at to begin with, but some sort of periodic cycle, probably definitely less than seven years. Uh, we're looking to top kill the shrubs and then maintain the, the patchiness of those shrublands. What I have here is uh, a picture um, of, a, of a project that shows a response of vireos to, to a type of treatment. Uh, the same slide I showed you earlier, this is a, the, what was uh, a shrubland at one time that has matured into a, uh, into a woodland. Um, after treatment with prescribed fire, uh, when we started it, um, if you look at the dots over on the right-hand side, you see one green dot. So in this area, there was only one detection of a vireo that was in this area. And this was 2008. Um, we did a combination mechanical treatment and a prescribed fire treatment in this area. 
all these photos are taken in, in the same place. Uh, this is the response, which you see is a lot of sprouts coming out uh, by the shin oak. The juniper is removed. It won't sprout back out. So what will come back is just the shin oak, uh, this, this brush uh, that the beer will like. And you can see that it's already low and patchy, which is what they prefer. Uh, so what is the response? 2009 still, which was the same year the treatment was done. Um, still, uh, so this is only probably one month after the burn uh, when when the um, you know vireo study was done still no vireo using this uh, the following year 2010 uh, the thing to pay attention is the 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 dots is presence of one bird the different color dots would be uh, multiple of birds uh, using this area so basically multiple territories so you can see that uh, one year post burn we have two birds setting up territory in the area. Three years post burn, we now have three birds almost exclusively using the treatment area uh, as their territory. And then the following year, we had four birds set up territory in this treatment area. So in just a few years, basically four years uh, from treatment, uh, four growing seasons after the treatment, we went from no birds using the area to four territories being set up uh, in, you know, with using prescribed fire, and in this case, mechanical. So the next thing we'll talk about, or last thing we'll talk about here is, how do we use fire to uh, manage golden cheek warbler habitat? Uh, it's a completely different habitat niche than the black cat vireo. Golden cheek warbler prefers mature woodlands. The picture here shows very mature woodlands, large trees uh, in some of the canyons uh, that the hill country has, uh, both of Fort Hood and Balcones. Um, and not just mature woodlands, it takes a, a specific canopy composition within those woodlands. It requires mature juniper and mature hardwoods. And this is a fall photo when the hardwoods change colors. So we're coming up usually about the end of November, 1st of December is when we really start seeing the fall color uh, in our canyons and, and hillsides in the hill country. Uh, and that's a, one of the best times you can really see this canopy composition that our woodlands are made up of many different types of trees, uh, both evergreen trees, which would be juniper and live oak, and then deciduous trees, which could be uh, a red oak or an elm or a hackberry. You can see a, a number of different types in this photo. But the main thing is these are mature woodlands, closed canopy, and mixed canopy composition with juniper and deciduous type hardwoods that make good warmer habitat. So one of the things that we find uh, through, through some different studies is that these woodlands have very low recruitment in the hardwoods, especially uh, the red oaks. The, um, a couple of studies here, this one out of the University of Texas showed that the last recruitment uh, of hardwoods in our woodlands uh, was between 1900 and 1935. That's pushing nearly a hundred years ago now or, or over 100 years ago now, uh, without any substantial recruitment uh, in woodlands. And that could be a problem because, as we said, the golden cheek warbler needs mixed canopy composition. They need these mixed woodlands. Uh, and without hardwood recruitment, they would become nearly or will become nearly pure stands of juniper, which would uh, degrade the habitat for golden cheek warbler. And so as we move forward, lack of oak recruitment could be one of the habitat problems the golden cheek warbler faces. So how can we use fire? Uh, some back to that dendrochronology work talked about. A number of things we learned um, is that if you, if you look at historical fire uh, areas where there were fires uh, that created canopy gaps, hot fire torches out the trees, burns through the crowns, um, creates canopy gaps. How do those canopy gaps close in over time? And canopy gaps that were associated with fire tend to come back in more deciduous trees. Uh, canopy gaps that were created, say, by just a mechanical means but didn't have fire, so maybe clear with a dozer or a chainsaw or something, they tended to close back in with evergreen, so juniper trees. So canopy gaps associated with fire uh, close back in more with deciduous trees. Canopy gaps that closed in uh, that were not associated with fire tend to close in more with evergreen or juniper. So this shows that uh, we can increase hardwood recruitment with fire. 
when we talk about fire um, in these woodlands, um, we do know that uh, the golden cheek warbler likes close canopy. So we're not really talking about trying to produce a fire that uh, torches out the canopy or kills the mature trees. What we're really trying to talk about is how can we maintain the canopy, but add hardwood trees, uh, reduce some of the juniper competition and add hardwood trees uh, back into the woodlands. Because if you think about if a tree wants to to turn, if a seedling wants to turn into a mature tree, it has to go through a number of things. And if you look at an acorn from a hardwood tree or, or a seed from a hardwood tree, um, it has to find a place on the ground, germinate, sprout, take hold, uh, and then start to turn into a seedling. Well, as soon as it does, it now becomes something that animals like to eat because most animals, whether it's a rabbit or whether it's a deer, they like to eat these hardwood seedlings. So there's competition. There, that's a predation, a predator on the hardwood trees. If you look at juniper, the same seed has to get established, go through the same process. But once it turns into a seedling, well, there's nothing eats the juniper seedling. So there's no competition, no predation on that seedling. So if you look at just those factors, um, juniper has an advantage because uh, nothing eats, uh, no animals eat the juniper. And so it has free, uh, no, no competition. So, so it has an advantage when it comes to recolonizing these canopy gaps or, or these open spaces into a woodland or any woodland. Uh, the juniper seedlings and saplings are there. The hardwood seedlings and saplings get eaten. So if we put in fire, if we add fire to that ecosystem, we already said that um, hardwood trees will re-sprout back out, juniper trees won't. So by adding fire, then we kind of equalize that um, or move the advantage over to those hardwood seedlings. They can re-sprout back out and then out-compete the juniper, which would then have to start over from a seed source. So when we talk about adding fire to the woodlands, we're talking understory fire, something that looks more like this where all we're doing is trying to remove juniper seedlings and saplings, remove some of the uh, smaller trees, um, juniper trees, and, and give hardwood trees an advantage. So a couple more um, slides. I'll show you some data of some projects, um, and that is uh, Post burn, uh, we find uh, hardwood trees respond very favorably. Juniper uh, uh, seedlings do not respond very favorably after burns. And so if we look at managing future of woodlands, data is showing that we can favor hardwood trees uh, with this type of prescribed fire. The next slide shows um, a before and after treatment uh, the nine column is 2009, the 12 columns would be 2012. So about, again, four year, four growing seasons apart. And then from left to right is the diameter class of uh, the stems, the trees inside uh, this treatment area. On the far left would be 0.3 inch diameter. So these are seedlings. And as you move to the right, 12 inch diameter, these are mature trees. Uh, and really what we're looking at here is the black bars is juniper. The colored bars is all other hardwood species uh, combined. So if you look at some of these uh, seedling categories, the very far left um, blocks, you see really equal amount. There's, there's a lot of hardwood seedlings out there. But as you move through the 1.23 and 5 inch classes, the black bars become dominant. And that's showing that Juniper trees are moving through the size classes. The deciduous hardwood trees are not, and that's where the browse comes in. Um, so the, um, the difference between the 2009 column and the 2012 column is the entry of prescribed fire. And so if you look in 2009 in the 1.2 inch column, uh, 2009, you see over 800 stem count of juniper. After the fire, you see relative pretty much zero. Um, and so you can see that you can remove both in the 1.2 inch and that three inch diameter class. The prescribed bar is very successful at removing uh, juniper uh, out of the woodland in that size class. 
and if and which would give the the hardwood trees the advantage and then as you move further into the upper classes you really don't see that the fire had much of an impact into the larger diameter trees and so this is showing that um, one way that we can utilize um, prescribed fire uh, to manage uh, warmer habitat so i'm going to step out of the or habitat for the golden cheek order warbler and i'm going to see if i can step out of the presentation now all right y'all got me back again all right so those are some of the reasons that we use prescribed fire uh, specific to this area specific to fort hood specific to balconies uh, there's a number of other reasons of of why uh, different programs or different areas may may use prescribed fire that is specific to their vegetation type uh, but this these are some reasons that are specific to ecosystem management we also understand that with prescribed fire we can uh, we can reduce fuel loads reduce uh, maybe reduce some of the impact that a wildfire would have on a on an area uh, by uh, by reducing maybe how intense that fire burns and by just having a periodic cycle of prescribed fire that always means there's recently burned vegetation on the landscape so any wildfire that started would have less land to burn because it had just recently burned in a prescribed fire which would be a management ignited fire uh, so something we're trying to use for a benefit and in fort hood's case um, there's lots of ignition sources at fort hood because of the training and as virginia said we know that uh, the army knows that and so we can utilize prescribed fire as a almost a secondary uh, a positive outcome is having that landscape burned which would be less landscape that could burn for a wildfire make wildfires easier to control so with that um if there's any questions i guess they'll be available for questions um Alyssa, any questions Okay, I, I have a couple of questions. I, I am fascinated by this. Um, I, I, you know, just kind of assumed that it was so that you can control wildfires. I had no idea that this was connected to bird and butterfly conservation. Um, my question is, you know, you, you've got a system on how to um, you know, when to create a burn. Do y'all do it with the migration cycles of the birds and the butterflies? Um, like, you know, to make sure they have a section for coming to Fort Hood and um, having a place to nest? Like, is it their cycle y'all are working with? So we definitely take into account the wildlife. Um, one of the, the big things that we look at is the migratory bird season. Um, so on Fort Hood, we are to pay particular attention between March and August. So we really try to minimize activities, whether it's burning or construction activities during that period of time. Now, we still can do prescribed burning, but we definitely take a look at where it is and what kind of effect it's going to have and then the, the size of the footprint. And so our prescribed burning program targets the majority of our burning between about November to March. So late fall throughout the winter. Um, and part of that is because during that period of time, we can get the fire effects that are desirable for us. Um, but we definitely do consult among our office as we're planning the prescribed burns. There's subject matter experts that deal with various species. And so we coordinate with them and the people that are managing the monarchs have areas that they would like us to target with prescribed fire so they communicate that to us and so we try to work those into our overall objectives but yeah so and the, the fact that we're doing these based on fire return intervals that would be desirable means we're not burning everything every year we're doing portions and we're um, those areas that we burn are kind of spread out and then carl did you have anything you would like to add on that topic Well, I think, I think the, so yes, we do try and, and try and pick burns that are beneficial for, for whatever objective we're trying to meet. And I know that uh, sometimes it, it doesn't seem uh, 
maybe not the most intuitive, like why do you, how do you, how do you burn to help something? Uh, but it, it's all about vegetation response and it's what vegetation we want to respond and, and say the monarch butterfly, which requires milkweed. And so when's the best time to burn to uh, promote milkweed? And, and we'd want to try and target that. Um, now, anytime you do burn, there is a short term negative consequence, right? Recently after the burn it now, vegetation has to grow be, before it's beneficial. So we do understand that that's where the rotation and patch size, how much are we going to burn at any one given time does come into play. Well, um, today I've learned that juniper is not a good thing. <laughs> um, like if you guys were not doing the prescribed burns, it, it looks like juniper would, you know, like we just left the ecosystem the way it is, that would start taking over. And would these, would the birds, the black cap vireo, all of that would, is this what's, you know, connected to um, endangerment of birds is invasive species all over our country that's just going to run in amok? So, so I first I want to start off with, we don't consider the juniper to be bad necessarily. So it's just that we want to keep it in the right balance or the right proportion because it definitely has its place. And then invasive species definitely do impact the, the, the animal population because they develop certain niches and they need a certain type of vegetation or the ecosystem to be in a certain way. So that definitely is an issue. Um, we have, gosh, we have invasive species all over the installation. So um, we, for example, we have someone right now that's doing a study looking at the timing of when we do prescribed burning and how that can reduce the invasive KR blue stem and pr promote our native grasses and our native blue stem population. So, and Carl, do you have anything to add on that? Well, yeah, de definitely want to want to say that juniper does have its place. If you look at the golden cheek warbler, that's a species that is very adapted to requiring uh, ash juniper as, as a habitat requirement component, a component in their habitat. And that's something that has taken hundreds, if not thousands of years to develop that specific niche. That's not something that is learned within a few decades. So that shows us that juniper has been around for a very long time, that this species has has that type of, of habitat requirement, developed that niche. But it's in the right place and, and it's in the right uh, composition. Uh, even within what we see within warbler habitat, these oak juniper woodlands, uh, we see places that have no fire historically, 100 years plus with no fire, and how they're becoming more and more just a monoculture of juniper. And then we see places, especially at Fort Hood, where there is such a high frequency of fire, not just prescribed fire, but also wildfire, where these woodlands have burned probably too frequently. And, and now we see that there's almost no juniper component to the woodland, only hardwood component, because fire, uh, juniper does not respond positively to fire. And so... So you kind of see you kind of see where this balance is, where there's not enough fire and too much fire, and you know wh where's the balance. But uh, in the absence of fire, I, I would tend to agree. There's other components out there, but if you had a, 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 a an area of land, an ecosystem, in the absence of fire, over time it would tend to be a monoculture of juniper, and so. Uh, juniper has its place. We want to promote that every way we can, but it also... You froze up a little bit there. Well, um, okay, okay, so if you, if you said something, I missed the last little bit of what yeah, you said. Yeah, we, we missed the last part of it there. Well, um, one, do you one want me question repeat I that or, Are we good? Or do you want me to repeat Yeah, we're good. Something? We see you again. We see you. Well, since we're a college, um, you know, it, it's the science of coordinating 
the the you know the birds the butterflies the trees the the burn times um what can students possibly what you know um focus on in their studies you know if they want to get involved in the things that you guys do what where what's some directions that they need to be studying so i think First is to, to develop a really good foundation in science. Um, it's the basic biology that you that you need to start out with. So ecology, the talking about just like that basic successional stage, understanding the life history of the animals, the plants. Um, so just having a good, well-rounded foundation. So most of the people in our office, for example, to be hired under the wildlife series, you have to take a certain number of classes under plant biology, under zoology, um, you know, under wildlife, so that you have a good understanding of the basics of this, because then what happens once you get into your, into a job or you get hired someplace, then they'll ask you to delve into a specific segment of that and become a specialist in, you know, an expert on that particular topic. So cool. be a good student. <laughs> and yeah, and even from our end, um, so one of the interesting things, and this is something that when I was in school, I didn't even even didn't even know existed. I, I have a degree in wildlife biology uh, and then got into this uh, fire profession. Uh, but almost almost in all land management agencies, either at a state or federal level. Uh, wildland fire prescribed fire is, is a is a firefighting duty, uh, which means there's firefighter requirements that have to go along with that. So you have to have this combination of both a, an ecological background, and it can be in a number of different studies, uh, but then you also, uh, there's there's fire training that goes along with that. And so I, uh, a lot of folks get into the, the wildland fire business uh, without any education, and then realize that they that you need education uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna stay in it. Um, so I, I think from, from early on, if this is something that interests you, if, if you're seeking a land management position, uh, prescribed fire is probably going to be a part of that. I've uh, started learning not only the ecological side, but also what it takes to the, the, the firefighter, the wildland fire component to that. Yeah. Well, that's it. I saw the picture you had of the very small fire that you had going on the ground. And, you know, that to me is like such a science to know how to make that little tiny fire and not, you know, blow it up into, you know, taking out our entire forest, you know, <laughs> so. Well, um, Alyssa, any other questions? I don't know if she's there. Up, uh, oh, no questions. All right. Well, for now, um, I just want to thank you both for coming. Um, we and I see Kristen here as well. Uh, this has been the most amazing year of um, information uh, on our environment. I we've got one more in December, um, another bird one. But I kind of feel like I'm going to be sad when this series is over because we have learned so much from your department um, in, in what you are doing for our environment that, you know, the general population had no idea that you guys were out there every day, you know, helping species, understanding species, um, you know, controlling this, controlling that. Um, it's just, it's mind boggling. So I want to thank y'all for all your hard work in doing that. And um, we need people like you. I hope that there's a lot more people that will be getting involved in um, these these environmental science areas that are so important. If we're going to keep our, you know, our species, we're going to, you know, just help out the environment. These are ways people think of, you know, recycling, and then we're done. And it's like, no, 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 no. You don't understand. You know, it's it's much more than that. So, so I want to thank you both for uh, coming today to visit with us. 
Um, before we go, I just want to re remind everyone that we have a few more um, classes coming up. We have uh, self-defense coming up on the 26th. We also, hang on a sec. Sorry, I needed my cheat sheets. <laughs> we also have uh, drumming that will be coming up and um, that's November 2nd. Um, and I want to remind everyone that in 2023, we are um, doing a military history series the entire year where we are uh, getting people from around our community to um, sign up to just tell life stories. And we're going to be doing a lot of the military. So if you know anyone who is interested in talking about um, their life in the military, be a, a soldier or a journalist covering it, or um, a military wife, military child, environmental specialists who, you know, are affected by the military. Um, this is something that we're looking forward to. And uh, we ask if anyone is interested to call us at 254 526 1621 because um, we are. That's how we're going to deal with history next year is by just listening to people talk about their stories. That's the absolute best way to learn. Thank you guys for telling us about your story about um, prescribed burns. I now I, I got it like a kid. I got all excited. Oh, look, smoke. Now I know what's happening with the smoke. So that that really has has enriched what I know. So I thank you guys for doing that and covering that today. Hi, for having us. Oh, well, um, you guys, we, we're going to go ahead and uh, have Alyssa take us out. We hope that everybody has a good day. Please enjoy the lovely, cooler weather. <laughs> yes. And, and right. you guys as well. But don't leave. We're going to have Alyssa take us out. So thank you guys again.